Hey everyone, Mr. Weiland here with uh, Chapter 13, Section 2. I'm going to briefly kind of go over this. Um, we're talking about women in the 20s. Um, it definitely changed in this era uh, in the 1920s. Um, you know, beforehand, women were kind of, you know, kind of boxed in. You know, this is your role in society. Not that you couldn't get a job, but you're limited on your jobs, your opportunities. But we start to see after World War One you know cities pulling women, young women into this you know this area we see a lot more rebellion a pleasure loving atmosphere in the 20s a lot of women are getting this opportunity to really showcase their freedoms as men um, did as well the flappers right here in blue so after the 20s, we see um, a new ideal emerge for some women that the flapper and anticipated young woman who embrace the new fashions of the urban attitudes of the day. Basically, um, these were women who basically um, embraced um, new ways of uh, new fashions that were out there available to them and opportunity to showcase um, the urban setting a little bit and enjoy, appreciate that, that time and um and just kind of be able, be able to be a little bit more open and and not afraid to wear uh, dresses that were above the knees or, you know, a little bit skin tone tight, um, you know, a little bit more tighter and less loose. Um, um, and also wearing uh, pumps or heels. And um, also we see strings and beads and, you know, jewelry is also being thrown out there. And young women uh, clipped their long hair and boyish bobs and dyed in uh, jet black hair. And so the hair is, is definitely, you know, changing at this point in time. Plus, we're also seeing women are doing things that men usually would do, like cigarette, drink, you know, smoking cigarettes, drinking in public and um, speaking openly about their love life and uh, not being afraid of certain taboo topics like sex. So these are things that are happening during the 1920s. Uh, number five is the shimmy, Charleston, Tango, uh, Camel Walk, and Foxtrot, if you want to write those down for number five. But the attitudes towards marriage change as well. Um, we see that, you know, as more and more women and men are going out dancing and and, and participating in the, in the nightlife, the nightclub life, like doing the Foxtrot or the Charleston or the Shimmy, um, attitudes are changing as far as how uh, marriage is. You know, it used to be there was a, some sort of a partnership, a, um, you were going to, you, you kind of had an idea who you would marry. Most of the time it was a close friend that you have been, uh, you know, and the, and the child, um, you know, as a child, you knew a, a girl and built a good friendship. And eventually you're like, hey, let's get married and let's have kids. But we're starting to see this change that more and more men and women are marrying out of love and not out of um you know, certain arrangements. We see magazines, newspapers, advertisements are promoting the image of the flapper, you know, really showing, showcasing women, hey, you can be a little bit more provocative. You can be a little bit more, uh, you can sexualize, you know, things a little bit more than you could before. Um, so this is a lot, opens up the door for new uh, flaunting of new outfits and um, the flappers becoming a more of an image of rebellion of the culture, the attitudes. And um, so during the 1920s, more morals started to loosen up because beforehand it was all like, no, that's taboo. You can't talk like that or you can't be like that. But now we're seeing with the flappers, it's giving women a little bit more of a sense of strength and power. We're seeing uh, traditionalists in churches and schools are protesting these new dances, these new type of look, the smoking, the drinking. We're seeing uh, um, in years before World War One, you know, women could only you know, marry um, certain individuals. But in the 1920s, we're seeing a little bit more casual in relationships. There is a double standard, though, and that is your definition in blue for double standards, that there was a set of principles granting sexual freedom to men nor to women, that it was okay for men to talk this way or act this way or, you know, be with other women. Um, women with other men, that was kind of still, you know, viewed as not, not morally right, even though that it's pretty much the same with what men were doing. So there's a double standard. Obviously, um, women are held to uh, much more higher standards than men are. Um, and so this becomes a bit of an issue um, moving forward and still is kind of an issue today, even when we talk about equality is that, you know, uh, you know, we kind of view that, you know, men are given a little bit more freedoms to do this, whereas women, it's not, you know, we, we tend to use name calling and peer pressure and things like that to, um, to really, 
um, keep roles different or separated and allow men to have a little bit more power and strength than women. And so it gets, it gets complicated, you know, as culture moves forward, but we are seeing a little bit more of those gender gaps start to come in a little bit of more equal and on the same page over time. And so we see that, um, the world is changing over time. Roles of women are changing the work that we're able to go to work. And we're seeing industrial economy is booming with opportunities for women in the work, but also, you know, new appliances are being made and it's opening up the doors for women. that are staying at home as mothers. So, um, Women were able to work successfully during the war and afterwards um, employers were starting to give those jobs to men um, because, you know, those men were coming back and they needed jobs. So unfortunately, women, um, again, this is where it's the double standard. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter if you're doing a great job. we got to get that job to a man. And so that was kind of the unfortunate thing. But women continue to seek uh, paid employment opportunities. Many female uh, college graduates turn to women professions uh, and became teachers, nurses, and librarians. So that's answer number six right here in this point. We do see businesses uh, required extensive uh, correspondence and record keeping. So they needed people to take care and file and do some certain things around the office um, to help out as best they can. Others became clerks in stores and held jobs on the assembly lines. Um, here, answer number seven is 10 million. A handful of women broke uh, the old stereotypes during this uh, time, uh, such as flying airplanes, driving taxis, drilling oil wells. Um, in 1930, 10 million uh, women were earning wages. However, few rose uh, managerial jobs and whatever they worked, women earned less than men. Fearing competition for jobs, men argued that women were just temporary workers whose real job was at home. Between 1900 and 1930, we see the patterns of discrimination and inequality for women in business were established. So we're seeing that women were treated differently and I'm still an issue today. Uh, we do see that the widespread social economic changes um, reshape the family life. Uh, birth rate actually declined. And a part of that makes sense. I mean, as more and more women are going, hey, I'm going to focus on my career. Um, I'm going to not decide to have children. I'm going to postpone that until later. So we do see the birth rate kind of go down. So uh, it drops. Uh, we see that um, it ultimately dropped slightly faster in in 1920s. The decline uh, uh, due in part to uh, wider availability of birth control as well. Um, birth control was created by Margaret Sanger, who opened up the door for this clinic in the United States in 1916. Um, she basically what happened? She was a nurse. She was helping. Um, mostly with women who were uh, struggling with pregnancies. And, um, and she basically had, had numerous stories where women were coming in and could not survive certain pregnancies or, um, you know, because they've either, hey, had too much children or, B, or too many children or B, um, they themselves were just, you know, could not bear on that responsibility. Their bodies couldn't take it. Um, and then also, too, there was illegal abortions going on at that time. So that that was a big concern of hers. And so she figured out we need to create a drug that could possibly um, numb the, the the which is the ovaries, but the part of the body of women to help, you know, produce the eggs and the, the baby making process. Um, if we could just somehow neutralize that narrow, you know, we can figure out a way to. Um, prevent women from getting pregnant. And so that's how she was able to work with a scientist who came up with birth control. And then they founded the American Birth Control League in 1921. Um, and then ultimately working to provide birth control information to patients and ultimately opening up the door for more um, opportunities for healthcare for women. And so at this same time, social and technological inventions are happening. Science is playing a big part, and it's also helping women at home. We see that stores are overflowing with new products, uh, ready-made clothes, sliced bread, canned foods. Foods. We're seeing public services um, for health care, and uh, we're seeing uh, the helping the sick and, and, and showing some sort of 
opp opportunity to help others. Um, there's other things, innovations that helped home workers as well. Um, middle class housewives, uh, the main shopping, shoppers, money managers, focus on the attention in their homes, husbands, children, and pastimes. Marriages were based increasingly on romantic love, though, at this time, and, and champion, uh, companionship, your friendship. Uh, but children no longer had to work, um, so and so adults were working in the factories, which opened up more jobs for men and women. And then you're seeing that eventually schools allowed kids to go and not have to go to work. But parents began to rely, uh, rely more heavily on manuals of child care and, and figuring out how do I raise this kid at, at the age of two months? And so, and, and then as they get older, what do I do then? So those are on the rise. We're also seeing uh, working class and college educated women are quickly discovering uh, pressure of juggling work and family. Um, so this becomes a problem. As women adjusted changing roles, some struggled with rebellious adolescence at the time as well. We're going to talk more about this. Uh, teens in the 1920s. 20s, studied and socialized with other teens and spent less time with their families, which becomes more problems with peer pressure and other issues. And then you see flappers resisted societal control and then education becomes a big key in dealing with these attitudes at the time. All right, we are done with section two. Section three, we'll get more into education.